Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll tell you about. So early in the morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship, then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. And he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you've not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his young men and they got up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham settled in Beersheba. Now after these things, Abraham was told, Milcah also has born sons to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn, his brother Buz, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel fathered Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Rumah, also bore Tebar, Gaham, Tehash and Marka. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you've got a sermon outline there inside your bulletins and God willing, there'll be time to uh, spend in questions at the end uh, and there might be some questions, who knows. Uh, but I want you to begin by exercising your imagination. Uh, I want you to imagine a scene that you are part of. Uh, you're part of a Jewish family, part of the nation of Israel. Are you sitting around the family fire one night? The days come to an end, uh, the stock are all carefully away in the enclosure just across the road. They're guarded by the shepherds. Dinner's finished, you're all gathered together, sitting and talking and gazing into the fire. And as you sit together, one of the younger children calls out, Hey, father, hey, mother, can you please tell us the next part of Abraham's story? Because that's what you do as a family as you sit around the fire at night. That's a familiar story. It's the account of your history and your heritage, where you've come from as a people. It's a story that tells of God's promise to a man named Abram who becomes Abraham to give him a family, a land and a blessing. A series of promises that has implications for the whole world. That's a familiar story because it tells of God's promise to use this family to deal with the brokenness of the world, to roll it back and bring God's approval. It's a familiar story that tells of God's actions to bring about a son for Abraham and his wife Sarah so that they could have a family. 
It tells of God's amazing, persistent mercy in bringing this son to life, even though the man was a 100 and his wife was in her 90s. It's a familiar story that tells of God's assurance that through that one boy, the family of Abraham would come about and be growing strong as a nation to emerge. It's a familiar story that tells of Abraham's gradual growth in trusting God. He's been declared right with God because he took him at God's word and that faith has grown and deepened and developed and sent out roots right throughout his life. But it's always been the same, that faith, in this familiar story. It's always been in God and his promise. And so as you sit there and as you prepare to share the next episode, you gather your thoughts because you know that the next episode is confronting, to say the least. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that it is the revelation of your nature. Father, give us a deep, heartfelt desire to know you through your word, a desire to call you Father because you provide what is needed for our life. Father, thank you that we can sit under your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline, after these things. That's how you begin the story with your family. And you can imagine the reaction across the family because everyone knows what after these things means, don't they? They know what's happened. Everyone looks at each other with a grin by the fire and some of the kids start chortling and whispering to each other and everyone's smiling because everyone knows what's happened. Everyone's laughing. Isaac's been born. After these things, laughter has come into the camp. Abraham and Sarah have laughed at a time they never thought they would because God has done exactly as he promised. He gave them a son called laughter. He brought life from bodies as good as dead. He granted them what they could not work for or achieve. And everyone remembers those words from last week as you were sitting around the same fire as you were moving camp. Your offspring will be traced through Isaac, Genesis 21.12 in our Bibles. Isaac is the foundation of your people. Isaac is the foundation of who you are. No Isaac, no people of God. No Isaac, no people of God. After these things, God tested Abraham. Well, the grins disappear pretty quickly around the fire, don't they, at that point? The laughter stops. And everyone leans forwards. The youngest stops mucking around and stops jostling and freezes because they know what this means. In fact, everyone's got questions because hasn't Abraham's whole life already been a test? Hasn't he passed a number of tests? Hasn't he shown that he's struggling to obey God, that he trusts God? Surely he's passed all the tests. What kind of tests could be left? Look there in your Bibles, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll tell you about. Well, the mood around the fire is suddenly pretty still, isn't it? It's cold. There's a shock. At the sound of burnt offering, all the little ones suck their breaths in. The older ones bow their heads. The young ones shake their heads. How's this possible? Now, God knows the significance of what he's requested. Did you see the repetition there in verse 2, just driving home the point about who Isaac is, your only son whom you love, your son? God's asking Abraham to sacrifice his boy, his only beloved son, Isaac. God is commanding Abraham to offer up his sole heir, the one through whom his people will be reckoned and the blessing to the world brought. How is that possible? Do you notice that Abraham doesn't know it's a test? Abraham's been asked to do something that we think is monstrous, 
something that is terrible, horrific, remarkably difficult and inconceivable at best. How is that possible? Can you imagine everyone looking at each other around the fire and the young ones especially because they might only be hearing this for the first time? And a test proves something, doesn't it? And as you sit as a group and you think about this around the fire as the storyteller pauses for it to sink in, you realise that this is an opportunity for Abraham to be proved and for God to prove. On the one hand, Abraham is tempted at this point. Isaac's 14 or 15. Now You know how it is when your long-held dream comes true because you start investing in that material thing. Can you imagine the temptation for Abraham to start trusting in Isaac and not God? To trust in the provision of the promise, not the one who provides in the promise? Can you imagine that Abraham is starting to trust in his own son, not in the one who provided the son? On the other hand, can God still be trusted? I mean, he's come through with something pretty amazing. He's produced one mercy after another. I mean, We run out of generosity. Surely God will stop at some point. Is he really as wonderful as he appears? And the test is there to prove both God and Abraham. Does Abraham trust God or does he trust the product of God, Isaac? Is God really able to provide what he says, a nation through Isaac? Well, the the storyteller continues and you need to remember that this story is embedded not in their minds but also in their minds and their hearts. It's been memorised and passed down from generation to generation. I'm at point three on the outline and when you look at the story, it is really sparse, isn't it? It's not like a Hollywood movie with all of that that surging music when you're meant to feel emotion. It's just the facts, isn't it? Did you notice that? Did you notice there's no emotion in this passage? It's just bare, sparse storytelling. Abraham's mind is not investigated. His emotions are not discussed. Perhaps it's obvious. But notice that it means that we can focus on what Abraham does. Look there in verse 3. So early in the morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God has told him about. Just a, a slight aside, I've been fascinated by early in the morning in Genesis. Do you notice how often it occurs, that phrase? And it's often connected with obedience or disobedience. It's a sign. Abraham gets up first thing the next morning and does exactly as he has been commanded. Whatever else has happened to Abraham over these last 40 years, it seems that he has now developed under God a trust in God that is remarkable. Every time Abraham has responded rightly to God and every time he hasn't, God's done exactly as he says. And it's starting to settle in who Abraham is. He wakes, he prepares everything and they set off. I I can't imagine that journey. Three long days. Thinking, pondering and praying. Sitting down opposite the campfire with your boy. Eventually Abraham reaches the place where God has told him to go and at that point he tells his servants to stay. Look there in verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. And everyone just suddenly sits up around the fire. You see, when you're in oral culture, you listen to words, don't you? Did you notice the personal pronoun there? We'll come back. Hang on. God's just told you to go and sacrifice your boy and you're saying we'll come back? Yeah, Abraham's got an immense confidence at this point, doesn't he? A certainty that God can do as he promised. There's no doubt in Abraham's words or actions, we will return, me and the boy. There's a bedrock trust here in God, isn't there? What Abraham is about to do flies in the face of human logic, doesn't it? Flies in the face of everything we think is common sense. But he knows that it doesn't contradict theologic. God's design, the plans of God. 
God can be trusted to do as he promised. The lion will come through Isaac, will come back. The wood's loaded up. Abraham takes the fire and the knife. They set off. The journey's a poignant one. As the group listens and looks at each other, there are tears rolling down cheeks and the children sit there with mouths open and some of the mothers drop their heads. And then look there at verse 7. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father. And he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. It's a heart-rending question, isn't it? (laughs) Can you imagine being asked that question? As the group listens, there might have been sobs. Do you notice that it's the question of a boy who trusts his father? Do you notice that? It's an answer of unswerving trust and faith in God from Abraham. Do you notice what he says? God will provide. God will provide. That's been the track record of God, hasn't it, for Abraham in his life? If he says the family line will come through Isaac, it's going to come through Isaac. I don't know how, but God will provide. That much is certain to Abraham. It's taken 40 years for him to get to this point, hasn't it? Each time he's trusted God, God's never let him down. Each time that he's taken matters into his own hands in the mess, God has not let him down. Each time Abraham's trust in God has been exercised and grown, but the object remains the same. It's God, isn't it? And Abraham's faith in him has been strengthened as it's been exercised. And it's taken root in him. So that he can even do this, trust God in this, not trust in Isaac, but trust in God. Trust in the one who provides and they walk on in silence, they reach the top. Do you notice how the pace slows down? How good's the Bible at storytelling? It happens with the crucifixion of Jesus. It just slows down. And each activity is described. Look there at verse 9. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac, placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. How obedient is Isaac? How obedient is Abraham? Don't tell me that a 15-year-old boy couldn't overpower this man over a hundred. He could have done it, couldn't he? Abraham obeys. Isaac obeys. Abraham reaches out. Abraham takes the knife, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And the whole group around the fire just lets out this collective sigh, don't they? Because you didn't realise that you'd stopped breathing as you listened. You didn't realise that you were clenching your jaw clenching your jaw, and you closed your fist and you were tense as you saw Abraham reach out for the knife and suddenly the angel of the Lord intervenes you. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that great? The intervention of God, the sacrifice is stopped. There's no doubt as Abraham stands there before the angel of the Lord that Abraham has stood the test, is there? And the angel of the Lord speaks. Look at verse 12. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your only son from me. And again, the the group listens because the angel didn't talk about obedience there, did he? He talked about fear. Did you notice that? He talked about fear of the Lord. He didn't talk about faith. He didn't talk about obedience. He talked about fear. It's worth noticing, isn't it, those words? But the two are tied. When you trust God, you fear him simultaneously. You can't separate the two. And the two develop out of listening to God's words. Look at it right throughout the Bible. Psalm 19 is a classic. The fear of God 
comes from trusting God when you hear God's words and respond to them. And that's exactly what Abraham has done, hasn't he? He has heard God's words and responded rightly to them. That's fear of the Lord. That's trusting God. And he has been revealed as a man who doesn't trust in Isaac, but trusts in the God who gave him Isaac. He trusted in the plans and purposes of God, not just in the material benefits of God. He trusted God. He obeyed God, which showed that he feared God. And God provides. Did you notice that? Did you notice that God gave him what he needed there in verse 13, just like he said to his boy? Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. God provides. God provides. And so he names that place, doesn't he? What an appropriate name. The place where God provides. God has proven trustworthy and Abraham has proven trusting. And God reaffirms his promise, doesn't he? Look look there, verses 15 to 18. Last time we hear that promise reaffirmed in Abraham's life, do you notice the thrust of the promise? It's all to do with who will come from Isaac and how that will roll out into the world. Can you imagine the mood around the fire after this story is finished? The roller coaster they've been on. Wide smiles because you sit there and you're one of those pieces of sand on the seashore that have come from this man who was laid on the altar, who was allowed to live because God provided. Tears are wiped away, there are hugs and little kids are cuddled and old men and women look at each other with knowing smiles and everyone can laugh because you sit there because God provided and Isaac lived. They're the promises that God made to Abraham, passed to Isaac, through Isaac to Jacob, as we'll learn, onto the people of God, a people more numerous than you could count, a land abundant beyond imagination, a blessing undeserved but seeping out into the world. The promises of God presented one last time in Abraham's life in hypercolour and the group sits there and they know that that promise was fulfilled. Well, the obvious question for us today is, well, we're not sitting by a campfire, are we? We're not a culture of oral history. This isn't our story by ethnicity. So what do we do with it? (laughs) I'm at point five on the outline. What do we do with a passage like this? Now, the way I've described it shows you how it is understandable for God's people, the Jews, doesn't it? They can sit around that campfire because this is a living testament to God's promises. But what about us now? I'm not sacrificing anything today. We're not sitting around a campfire. We're at a time where child sacrifice has ended rightly. We're here in Narrabri and not in Israel. What do we do with this passage? Now, I want to acknowledge that it's not an easy passage. I think Andrew captured it very well. It is a strange passage, isn't it? A strange, strange passage. It sits dangerously, if you like, with our modern sensibilities, our expectations, our picture of God and his word and his world. But I want you to notice there at point five on the outline that there are some simple observations that help us unlock it. First, as we grapple with a passage like this, we've got to think, is this passage reporting firstly or is it recommending firstly? Is it a reporting or is it a recommending passage first and foremost, because that will help us unlock what's going on. I I think this is a passage reporting a specific moment in God's plans. It's a reporting passage, first and foremost. Once we recognise that, we can then work out what it's recommending as it sits across the whole Bible. And so one of the things that this passage can safely say is it's not God's reasonable recommendation to his people to sacrifice their children. Because this is reporting a moment. And we need to get that straight so we don't misapply it, don't we? Secondly, once we've recognised that, we need to then recognise what a test is in the Bible so that they come together. 
Oh, we know what a test is in life, don't we? It's about seeing how strong something is. Oh, we often test things to their breaking point. I think there's a subtle difference in the Bible with testing. In the Bible, testing is not so much about breaking as it is about proving. And it's a subtle difference. In the Bible, testing is not so much about breaking as it is about proving. In an instance like this, when God tests Abraham, he not only proves that Abraham has his faith in the right place, but God himself is proven, isn't he? As faithful, as someone who does exactly as he says. And so Abraham's shown to have faith in the right one because God is proven at the same time, proven as the provider. And then we've got to ask ourselves a third question. We've got to ask ourselves, who do I identify with in this story? It's always a good question to ask. Who am I meant to identify with? Now, that's why we told the story in a particular way, because when you're seated around that fire as a Jewish family, who would you identify with? Well, it's not the young men. It's not the ram. I don't think it's even Abraham. You identify with Isaac, because if there's no Isaac, then you don't exist. Isaac's the one you identify with. And when you get that straight, you then realise that you only live because God provided a substitute for Isaac to live. God proved faithful. You only live because God provided a substitute for Isaac to live. And that's who you identify with. You live because God provided a substitute. As you sit there around that campfire, as you sit around the table in your little cottage, you see it time and time again when this story is told. God provides a substitute so you can live. It's there in the sacrifice. You go up to Jerusalem to present once a year. It's there in the sacrifice that you bring daily or weekly in your local village. It's there every time an animal dies instead of you. You remember that ram. So Isaac could live. God provides a substitute so that his people can exist. Now around that campfire, you didn't know where that would end up, did you? But we do, don't we? It ends up in a perfect substitute. Not a ram in a bush, but God in the flesh who came and lived and died so that the people of God could exist. What a mercy from God to intervene in such a way. What a proving of the faithfulness of God that in that last descendant of Abraham, God would roll back sin and bring his blessing. Now, this is the pinnacle of Abraham's life. doesn't get any better for Abraham, really, in his earthly existence, 40 years of trusting in God, that faith being exercised, God never fails, he's come to this point. And so if God can be trusted in the big stuff, we see it in Abraham's life, he can be trusted in the little stuff, even as we'll see over the next few weeks in providing a grave or a paddock. And so now we can move into the recommendations. And let me finish very briefly with these three recommendations. Nothing has changed for the people of God. God's people must trust in God, not in his material provision. God's people must trust in God, not in his material provision. Abraham didn't trust in Isaac, but he trusted in the God who gave him. And it was displayed. Do we do the same? God's people must trust God in all matters even when they appear illogical and go against the grain of our world. God has proven faithful in the big stuff, a substitute so that you might live. Surely we can trust him in the little stuff. Turn the other cheek. Be generous, aboundingly, for those who have frittered life away. 
the recommendation of grace over rights, the need for gentleness and self-control in a world that demands for me and indulgence. When he describes marriage and relationships and life and parenting in his design, when he describes our roles as men and women, as husbands and wives, as parents and children, as employers and employees, as men and women in a household, surely God will provide in that little stuff, won't he? If he's provided in the big stuff. And finally, God's people must exercise their faith. It's one of the great delights about being a runner. Am I going to make the first kilometre? If I do make the first kilometre, I'll probably make the second and then the third and then the fourth because the muscles have proven faithful. Will God really do as he says? Trust him. Trust him again. Trust him again. Trust him again. And he'll always provide. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your strange passages, but thanks for your simple truth. You provide what we need to be alive, eternally and temporally. Help us to trust in you and not just in the Isaacs that you give us. Help us to trust you in all the little stuff that you make clear. Father, exercise our trust in you daily because you are faithful. Amen.